So on a very pleasant and sunny morning, today we are in Kishanbagh in Jaipur, also known as the sand dunes of Jaipur. A part of a former park as we know it, redone, recreated over the last five years. I have with me Mr. Vijay Dasmana, who is instrumental in many parts in the recreation of this experience, something unique, something new. Vijay, good Thank morning. You. We are here in Kishanbagh and uh, it would be nice if you guide us through how was it done, what was the thoughts behind it and what more could we do to similar places, not only in northwestern India but rest of the country. Welcome to Kishanbagh. Thank you. How did Kishanbagh happen? I mean, there was a thought behind it, there was a philosophy behind it. You just walk us through that. Yeah, uh, it's an interesting journey. You know, we, I got to know through Pradeep because Pradeep was the lead in this project. And uh, I think looking at Raujoda Park, somebody mm, came to him, reached out to him that, why don't you do something in Jaipur? And many of the municipal gardens were shown to Pradeep. And he kind of told them politely that this is not what I do. You know, I work on restoring landscapes. So then they, by end of the day, they kind of realized what he is talking about. So they brought him to this landscape, which was a sand dune, you know, many sand dunes here, but degraded, pretty degraded here. And um, he got very excited about it. And then he conveyed it to us that, you know, we have got this opportunity to do this restoration work. And so it, that was the origin of Kishan Bagh. And we made a proposal, showed it to the, to, the minister, to the chief minister that this is what we tried to do. We are trying to restore the vegetation of the sand dunes, which is possible in this particular landscape. And also to create a place for people to kind of understand ecology of this place. So that's, that was the origin of this idea. And we wanted to, we hadn't done before this any sand dune restoration work. We had done, like Pradeep had worked in Raujoda Park, which is rocky rhyolite and sandstone work. And I had worked on Aravli Biodiversity Park, which was again quartzite, uh, mostly quartzite hills that uh, were being restored. And we had this idea that we want to bring in the plant community from the Thar Desert, which are kind of moving out. The whole landscape of Thar is changing, you know, very rapidly. And so we wanted to conserve and kind of show <coughs> in this little place that we have here. Very colonial legacy is a municipal garden. It has to be laid out, hmm. flower beds, lawns, bougainvillea. And the very moment we say a park, that's what people appreciate. So to move away from that into the concept of landscape and mm. its conservation, conserving the skyline, if you call it so. So uh, Kishanbag is actually now extremely popular, popular among youngsters. And the quality of interpretation, interpretation is always very important when it comes to appreciating nature. So uh, shall we take a walk through the park? And uh, the of course, a pleasure. <laughs> this is, by the way, this all the infrastructure that you're seeing is uh, done by somebody called Golak, who was part of the team. We have four people. Pradeep was the lead. <clears throat> then there is was an architect, landscape architect, Harpreet. And then architect Golak, who has the Teda Meda Bali ideas that he employed, and me. So, municipal parks, urban gardens, huh. wilderness, and restoration. Yeah. Is there a matchup? Is it, is it are so, they in conflict? Yeah. So I think the parks movement of understanding of the park uh, has changed and should change because the colonial idea, as you were, ask, were asking, was for a facility. You know, it was reminding you of your your native land. And here, our cultural growing up is different. You know, your relationship with the forest or the wilderness is of intimate uh, relationship, you know, livelihoods. Everything is kind of, kind of attached to it. So um, I think the parks have become very sanitized spaces. They are trees or plants are seen as features. 
So why you are planting a particular plant is only because it flowers at certain time, which might be only 15 days, and it looks spectacular in the, those 15 days. Yeah. So it's all about effects that you get in the landscape and nothing much about habitat or nothing much about the interrelationship. So the sense of beauty has to change. Our, our communi community sense of understanding of beauty has to change where we see relationships, where we see interdependence as something much more interesting for the community to watch, observe and therefore appreciate. And once you appreciate, you find it beautiful. You know, so it's not just one particular tree which is flowering in Feb and is looking awesome. It's, oh, this tree has so many bird population coming to it, so many animal population coming to it. It does look, you know, the interrelationships that it has with the insect world and so on and so forth. I think those all relationships have to be appreciated and that's what is slowly emerging. It's not there yet, but it is emerging. And I think this park is in that direction where it's trying to take people to make them understand the ecology and then therefore appreciate this ecology. You know, so the wilderness that we have around it has to be appreciated. And I think this is how we can sensitize our urban population and the rural population into the wilds that this is our heritage that we need to, we need to appreciate. Actually, yes, as you were very correctly saying that um, it's my, in my experience, more and more young people who wish to travel do not want to really spend time in a structured wild, but want to explore something which is new which is more wild in the real sense of the world and uh, that is actually good its interpretive value of the wilds is immense there are mm, competing claims on the land hmm. now what it invariably results in in any landscape is some degree of biological wealth a lot of heritage vanishes so how important is restoration of landscapes and habitat for the future conservative conservation needs? So firstly, I think uh, let's start with what India has signed for. You know, we have committed for 30, 30, 30, which is 30% 30 of our land into forests and also a milestone of 25 million hectares that we want to ecologically restore. And this being the decade of uh, restoration under UN um, is a very significant step to kind of look at the larger canvas that we are uh, you know the world is going through really tough times in terms of biodiversity uh, the WWF report in few years back told us that 50% of invertebrate species and here only we are talking about you know, uh, group, fauna, uh, limited uh, group. Uh, yeah, limited group, which we have not even studied. studied yeah, many must have got lost. So, fifty percent of our invertebrates have kind of gone extinct. It's a huge thing. It's a huge, it's a huge thing. thing. We don't know. We have not stu studied thar enough. The kind of plant communities that existed, or uh, the kind of faunal community uh, there were, that we perhaps would have missed. Um, I mean, you know, look at the uh, developmental work going in Thar. You know, it is, if we have to look at fog dominated habitats, we have to go right up to the border. Yeah. Yeah, to, to get to see the, what it would have been. So we are losing these beautiful uh, habitats and therefore the need to restore, therefore the need to bring back. Um, and most of them are short term. You know, the destruction is short term for the short term benefit Benefits, yes. and it has long term impacts yeah. because you can't easily bring back. You know, there is no plant material to bring back, you know, so that is not happening and therefore active restoration has to be undertaken uh, and the community of plants have to be brought in and that being the base for the faunal diversity to come in is seminal, very important and urban centers are becoming more and more important from, uh, you know, because our policies are, uh, unfortunately, our policies are driven sitting in cities. Yes. And therefore, what you touch, like I remember in Mangarbani, uh, you know, in Haryana, when we took the chief minister of uh, Haryana to see a forest which is privately owned in terms of the ownership, but a standing 
Anogaisis pendula forest, you know, maybe 300 years old. He was shell-shocked. He was like, really? This is what we are talking about? And he gave an order which is like from a buffer zone of 50 meters, he made it into a 500 meter buffer. And that kind of enclosed a larger area for conservation. At least in, you know, in, um, it hasn't got the legal sanctity, but at least somewhere no construction zone has been declared. So, therefore, these urban centers, a park like this, or a park like Aravli Biodiversity Park or a Raujoda Park are very, very important for people to kind of understand what is it that is happening far off and therefore needs more conservation. And therefore, this has come into, the, uh, in the, into our vocabulary now, restoration, rewilding and why it is important. And more and more it has to in, get ingrained to our policies that this is what we need to do. Also to make the international commitment that we have made as a nation but also what is happening around us, you know, the quality of life is degrading. You know, I often quote Delhi being the capital. Here, our water is contaminated, our air is polluted, our food that we get is toxic, and we don't have a quality of life. So where are we going as a society? This needs to be kind of, kind of rejigged and worked backwards and kind of take a back seat and look at the restoration. I think we need to do restoration. Uh, while on the topic of restoration, one thought which has crept in within the development sector in the state is uh, perhaps there is a need to create in the western desert more plant micro reserves. It's still not very structured as a concept, but what we're looking at is one or more species closed conservation so that they act as a nucleus for a source of biological material for expansion outward as and when we can conserve them and grow them. So uh, the desert landscape, the desert floral communities, the faunal communities are so sensitive to the slightest change mm. that unless and until we create inviolate areas for their conservation, it's difficult mm. to ensure that they survive. the Rui, the mm. interdunal flat, I believe it's extremely important as a conservation resource. Can mm -hmm. you expand mm. on this? Yeah, so uh, I mean it's a good question that you have asked. Uh, here at Kishinbark, what we are trying to do is, you know, the word Rui, uh, we are celebrating this word, you know. <clears throat> it's a traditional word from western part actually, from Punjab to Rajasthan to Gujarat. This word has been in use in different forms. So Roi is basically jungles of Thar or wilderness of Thar and it has different plant communities. So we see, you know, depending on the edific conditions, we get different kinds of plant communities. Too. So here what we are trying to do, what we, are, what, where we are right now is the Roi. Yeah, and this has happened. These are obstruction dunes, which are now fossilized world maybe thousands of years and uh, the plant community that is most happy to the extreme weather conditions you know summers are very hot now here the change is that in the monsoon you get also moist you know 500 mm to 600 mm rainfall and the winters are very very harsh you can see the frost uh, damage on yeah. the plants here so i think roes are <coughs> important because they have evolved with all these conditions. The plant communities have evolved with all these conditions and generally it's savanna kind of a feel to it. And the bird populations, oh, diversity, even migrating birds, uh, raptors, lots of raptors, that's what you see in the roes, right? <clears throat> so here what we, are, what we are trying to do is we have kumats, some patches of kumats, salvadoras, and mostly shrubs, mostly shrubs like your keep, your bui, your uh, pog, your uh, keep, and um, you know th these are what we are grasses, lots and lots of grasses. That's what we are celebrating. Now in the dune, you'll also get different plant community on the top of the dune. You'll get in the internodal dunes where the the soil is more compacted or there is some sort of uh, you know water accumulating, and therefore salinity or the um, soil texture is different <clears throat> there you get different plants yeah so you will notice that if you go to thar you will find in the interdunal areas you will find almost like forests of care 
Caparis Desidera. And it's an awesome, beautiful sight when they are in flower. You know, between the barren dunes, there is suddenly flush of this scarlet, scarlet you know, uh, trees having the scarlet color on them. So the interdunal um, areas are special, they are different. <clears throat> Depending on is the water flowing, is the water getting uh, contained there and so on and so forth. So yeah, so these, this is what we are trying to recreate here in the in kitchen bag. Yeah, thank you so much and care, when you said care flowers, I mean care flowers are so good looking. I mean peach comes a second best and care is more peach than peach ever was. <laughs> that's it's actually true. a lovely, it's a beautiful, beautiful flower yeah, out of true. these parts. Vijay, we have behind us a portion of the Aravalis, a name that immediately invokes a sense of history, a geological history with the oldest mountain ranges and perhaps the most neglected mountain ranges. Tell me more about the Aravalis, conservation requirements, what that is being done, what that more could be done. So, uh, I mean, that's a big question for me. But my exposure to Aravali is from the work that I have done at Aravali Biodiversity Park. So where we have restored 380 acres of mined quartzite uh, quarry into, into the, the forest communities that you find in the Aravlis, in the northern Aravlis, not, you know, Aravli is such yes, a such big a range. Yeah, range uh, yes. yeah, and the, because of the rainfall, like with the forest communities see in Udaipur, mm -hmm. it's very different Quite from different, what you, yes. yeah, from Sariska or even uh, up to Jaipur, you know, yeah. it's very different. So I think, yes, I totally agree with you that we have missed on the beauty of Aravli. Firstly, it has, um, it's, as you said, it's the oldest fold mountain in the world and um, it has to be cherished as a heritage, you Absolutely. know, and uh, there is one report uh, by uh, Professor Narpat Singh which says that 50% of the Aravlis in the northern Aravli is already, forest land has been already converted for developmental work, for agriculture and developmental work. So it tells you that, you know, they are very, very neglected. The, the, the forests are degrading. Um, in, in large part, it is kind of colonized by Prosopis juliflora. In, uh, not on so much on the high reaches, but in the valleys, everywhere, it is uh, Prosopis juliflora, which has kind of colonized the whole area. So there is a huge need to restore Aravis. Firstly, provide legal sanctity to, uh, we know that you, mining is important, but kind of be strict about mining, you know, so that the illegal mining which is happening in Absolutely. and around the villages and in larger areas, you know, where one hectare plot is given, but 50 hectares are being mined. And you recently, when the courts pulled up, uh, as States. to what is, uh, what, 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 where are those hills, you know. So I think first is to protect. We have to be very, very, um, diligent about it that we need to protect the Aravlis. This, this landscape that we are seeing is part of the Aravli system. Absolutely. Without the Aravlis, this landscape wouldn't have happened. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, we need to protect it and once we have protected it, we need to restore it. The restoration should be with the native species, the plant communities that exist. You know, you have beautiful salal forests existing now in the northern Aravlis. You have Anogaisis Pindula forest, beautiful, the Butia forest, you know, and so on and so forth, grasslands and savannah. All that I think we need to protect and um, restore. And we see lots of barren hills on the way. Perhaps we need to restore them bit by bit, bit by bit, you know, and get other players, you know. I think there is a, in today's time, there is a growing kind of agreement, understanding between uh, general masses that we need to restore these hills. And what that restoration would be, I think we have to lead in that. As forest departments, as people who are invested in eco-restoration, we should lead it, kind of guide it into getting a good restoration work done, you know, in terms of plant communities that get restored there. Yeah. So, uh, and there is money. 
there is money. I think the forest department and the other departments, they have to open up, get private players to come in and restore. Pool in, the resources. Pool and the resources in restoring, yeah. you know. And I have seen beautiful, you know, uh, landscapes which are huge potential to become internationally recognized sites within the Arablis for people to come and experience that kind of wilderness and that kind of also unfortunately mined, but yet beautiful in its own scarred, uh, kind of sentiment. Uh, we, we, we need to tell a story about about why we are doing mining and what are these, you know, beautiful, you know, after a hill, if you have mined a hill and you have left the whole column, uh, it, it does look beautiful in many ways and we can tell a story. There's a story in every escape. Absolutely, yes. absolutely. So I, I think the way forward is inclusive approach to restoration, get people involved. Um, get communities involved because they are the big stakeholders in the Aravlis as well and, uh, and and restore bit by bit bit by bit yeah and there is a win-win proposition for all for governments for uh, those who are involved in eco restoration and certainly the public at large in like Aravali Biodiversity Park has uh, got uh, the recognition as India's first OECM, is it? That's right. That's right. <laughs> yeah. So we yeah, got this. That's that's fascinating. I mean, mm. this is uh, as important as a site being declared as a Ramsar site. I mean, it's Absolutely. probably more yeah. because it's a direct uh, contribution to the country's carbon commitments. That's right. That's right. So I think we have this uh, this OECM, um, which is not legally uh, sanctioned in India yet. But hopefully in the new, there will be a possible of integrating into our laws where we can say that, you know, the lands which are with the community or uh, are not defined uh, as forest or protected, um, protected forest or reserve forest or a sanctuary or a national park can be biodiversity rich, like large part of Thar, large parts of Aravlis, yes. can be OECMs, you know, and get some sort of interest of the world community to look into it. Yes. Uh, including our own student community and the research community to come and you know play a significant role in conservation of these areas. I understand that uh, with those who are residing in a nearby Delhi, Aravali Biodiversity Park has turned out to be a very good attraction for experiencing the outdoors, for experiencing the wilds. I mean, what I get to see on social media that more and more people are traveling to that park trying to understand and it's good I mean it uh, presents before the public one of the best faces of conservation actually yeah, thank you very much <laughs> yeah it is it is becoming a place for uh, for the public to see but also for the researchers I think for me the biggest kick is that we have got DU we have got JNU we have got uh, forest department trainings happening in that park Fantastic. So JNU, uh, we have 12 hectare plots and there is a vegetation records being taken. There are There is an amphibian biologist who is looking at amphibians. Wow. So we have got all, um, eight species of amphibians in a small area like that and because of the clean water that we get from the rains and those pools. And we have got um, some researchers working on birds and butterflies there. So I think that's where, you know, the larger masses will get uh, filtered out storytelling yes uh, that this is what happens this is what happens you know we have can you believe we are, there is interest in amphibians frogs and toads <laughs> I mean, sit somewhere in Northwest India a statement seven eight species of amphibians in the Aravalis yeah. in most parts of the country and I come from the east of the country this is a statement that will immediately raise eyebrows and ears people will start paying attention it is that interesting it's fascinating actually yeah it may sound very very small number from a person who is coming from western ghats or even himalayas but um, but it's very significant for in our context it's very significant for uh, for our you know get it, like in the park we in the aravli biodiversity park we have got first record of about 68 species of butterflies wow uh, by two counts only two counts so that number is going to go up but uh, it may look not a big number but when you look at the context of the Aravlis and the degraded mine site then it makes us uh, it makes a lot of sense yeah, yeah, of interesting it's ab yeah. absolutely fascinating the sort of biological diversity mm. that an area could host mm. with a little bit of protection and absolutely care. absolutely and getting the right species in you know, um, yeah. because people, and that's what we have felt <coughs> a lot, because people, the whole general tendency is to green. And green is, green is to plant anything anywhere. That's the, 
that's the kind of general uh, understanding. Understanding, yes. And that we have to fine tune into creating habitats, and habitats are special. There have certain plant communities, and that message we have to keep on driving into our horticulture departments, into our forest departments, and even forest departments yes. for that matter, you know, to get this kind of habitat creation. And I'm very happy that I've worked with some of the forest uh, department people in Rajasthan and in uh, Haryana, and I'm very happy with the sensibility that these uh, officers are bringing out and, and, and are committing themselves. Of course, that tenure. Uh, commitment yes, and all of issues. that issues are there but somewhere the the uh, I think the awareness is much higher now on Which restoration rewilding good. and the community of plants to be put together and then bringing in the funnel uh, that automatically bringing brings in the funnel community yeah that's the point I try to make when I'm talking to my junior officers that look at the land be hyper local in your initiatives and even the people's participation, the community involvement, which is a major factor in conservation today, that too has to be very local. Absolutely. I mean, nobody could come and do it for us from outside. Absolutely. It's for us to do it very much here. Absolutely. That's and that, that's the, and such that's a significant yes. point. Yeah. It's difficult, but it's, yeah. it's doable. Yeah, yeah. I believe it's doable. Yeah. yeah, I mean, that's what I think the community participation, I think, is the biggest area for anybody who is into restoration or you know whether it is forest department the horticulture department or any department or, or NGOs you know community participation into restoration is going to be the most important indicator for restoration in this for country. a successful effort yeah, yes absolutely I agree thank you very much for saying that thank you it was, <laughs> it's been fascinating it's been wonderful yeah. Shall we? Yes, please. Vijay, what I have felt from my travels to different wilderness areas, the experience is complete to a significant extent if the interpretation is good. Kishanbag stands out for its interpretation, of course. So, uh, how, how difficult is it to communicate, number one? And how do you see interpretation becoming a calling not just a hobby, but a calling, a profession. Yeah, so I think uh, firstly, we'll have to thank Pradeep for doing an incredible job uh, with the designers in doing the interpretation here in the Kishan Bag Park here. Um, I would like to add that interpretation is very, very important for people to understand what, what the natural world is, you know, the different exhibits, the interpretive islands, tell you a story of, you know, the larger landscape, that people might go into the thar and learn and you know their eyes might get opened to looking into the plants and the animal world and the birds world uh, i think along with it it's also the guided walks the naturalist in our team you know monil dinkar incredibly you know doing engaging with the citizen here talking to the people making them see because it also needs a certain training into yes. seeing, you know, the inter interrelationship between insects and the birds and the all different forms of life, plants and the insects and all of that. So that they help in seeing. So I think it is very, very important to interpret, to tell the story. In a, in a, it is a part of restoration, at least at this stage, yes. where the community we are bringing up the community, the general consensus into restoration i think it is very important that all this is done once it is established then we can purely focus on restoration yeah. and uh, maybe maybe we'll have much more hands to you know you can't interpret the whole of the aravlis you can create an island you know some some small parks here and there for interpretation like you can't interpret the whole jungles but a national park or a sanctuary needs an interpretation yes. so that people can be aware what uh, a good interpretation, you know, that's storytelling, good storytelling, not just putting pictures. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes, it's a story that is what a person would remember. That's right. We live in the world of images, there's a million images passing us by every day. That's right. So it's very difficult to stay fixated on one image. But on the other hand, that story, mm -hmm. the narration, the story, the visuals, they all come together and create a very lasting imprint. A part of the memory is part of the conscious, which stays that's right. which is the measure of success that's right it's been a fine and educative morning 
today in Kishanba. We talked not just on this particular island of excellence out here, but on different landscapes out of the subcontinent, the Thar, the Aravali. Wilderness areas need to be respected. It could be a small wasteland within an urban settlement. It could be a wilderness area away from home. It is our choice not to litter it. It is our choice not to encroach upon it. And it is a choice not to abstract too much water. We respect nature. Nature will keep giving us back. With this, thank you Vijay. Thank you for explaining it all to us. And thank you our viewers for a very patient hearing. Thank you very much.